Thank you very much, uh, Minister Jonas Stirr, uh, Bob Carell, uh, Foreign Minister uh, uh, Perestig Müller, uh, to the United Nations Special Envoy and former Prime Minister of Peru Harlan Brundtland, my, my longtime friend, uh, to the Premier of, of, uh, from uh, Greenland, Kupik uh, Fleiss, uh, to the indigenous uh, leaders uh, who are here with us uh, as well, uh, to the scientists uh, who have done this work and who have done such a spectacular job. Thank you very much. And, and Bob, thank you for, for playing the, the key role that you have played. I think I've accidentally activated this. I, can, I think I know where it is. I'm going to show a few slides uh, as well, and there will be a little overlap, not much. I'll skip through the ones that uh, that uh, Dorte and uh, Bob Carell showed. Let me let me try to set the context for this report. As you realize, we're not talking here at at this meeting about the impact of the climate crisis on food insecurity or on creating deeper and longer droughts or bigger floods or moving tropical diseases away uh, from the equator toward uh, the more gentler <coughs> latitudes. We're not talking about the stronger ocean storms. We're not talking about the larger fires. We're not talking about a whole range of consequences, including the acidification of the ocean. We're just talking about melting ice. But I wanted to put it in that larger context. Ice is visible, and there's a big difference that one degree makes between ice and water. And that difference leads to a lot of other differences. High, surfaces that are highly reflective or surfaces that are highly absorbent. <coughs> Concentrations of CO2 and methane that are locked in place and those that are released to the atmosphere. So melting ice is really important. Not least because the fact that it's visible makes it easier for these scientists to communicate to lay people like me about it. <laughs> two years ago in Oslo, a little over, not much over two years ago, Jonas and I talked about his upcoming, about his leadership of the Arctic Council. And we talked about the value in expanding the focus of that Arctic Council to include the entire cryosphere of the planet, all of the frozen regions including the third pole, the Himalayas. 100 times as much ice and snow in the Himalayas uh, as in all the mountains of Europe, including Antarctica, the great mass of ice on the planet, including the Andes and the Rockies and the other mountain glaciers. And Jonas Sir did a fantastic job in taking that idea and thank you very much for inviting me to join with you, Jonas. It's been a great honor to work with you. And, uh, truly uh, one of the finest public servants I've ever had a chance to work with. And then we had, uh, well, I'm a recovering politician, so I can't <laughs> say those things. But, but we had the great good fortune of having this team of scientists respond uh, and do this uh, fantastic work. Let me show just a, a, a few slides. I'll run through these uh, quickly here. I say I will. The, uh, starting with the focus on, uh, on on the Arctic, and again the context, the concentration of CO2 is accumulating and trapping more heat. This is another view of the uh, two slides that Bob showed. The North Polar Ice Cap in 1980 looked like this, and in 2007 looked like this. 
it, it's hard to capture the <laughs> astonishment that the uh, experts in, sci in the science of ice felt when they saw this uh, minimum in 2005, which meant that uh, the amount of ice that had melted, it's been roughly the size of the continental United States, minus an area roughly the size of Arizona, nothing against Arizona. But the amount that melted in 2005 was equivalent to an area covering everything east of the Mississippi River in the United States. Then, and when the real shock to the scientists came was in 2007, when this happened. And, and their phrase was, it fell off a cliff. Uh, and then the extra amount that melted was this much. Now this does, this covers the area of ice. It does not cover the volume of the ice, and Bob Perel referred to this. The U.S. Naval Postgraduate School has a team that integrates the U.S. Navy's nuclear submarines that go under the ice cap and satellite measurements that are calibrated and work with it. And based on that, they said actually 2008 had a smaller minimum, probably, than 2007. And these are figures uh, that are fresh. I don't know if they've been, uh, I don't know when they were released, but I just got them yesterday from, uh, from uh, Dr. Bachelot Maslowski at the Naval Postgraduate School. And this is the volumetric record of the ice. And uh, some of the models <coughs> suggest to Dr. Maslowski that there is a 75% chance that the entire North Polar ice cap during summer, during some of the summer months could be completely ice free within the next five to seven years. Bob used the figure of 2030 and the volumetric analysis leads this uh, Dr. Maslowski to make that projection. We will find out. Now, I want to set this up. Bob referred to the Arctic being a beating heart. I'm going to show you a beating heart. This is a, called a cardiothermogram. It's, a, it's just to set up the slide that comes after. And what I'm going to show you after this is the Arctic expanding and contracting almost as quickly as this does. And when it expands, the dark blue is the winter ice, thinner and it expands over a larger reach, and then it contracts in the summer. Uh, and, and now, here's the difference. This is a color-coded presentation that's designed to pick out the old, thicker ice. The ice that you see in, in red, as this beating heart in the next slide shows, is the so-called permanent ice, five years old or older. And you see, each, each one of those beats is a year, we're now at 88, and it's going forward. And the red ice is getting smaller uh, in, in amount. It's almost like blood spilling out of a body along the <coughs> east coast of Greenland there. And so it's gone in, in uh, less than 30 years from this to this. So, on a regional basis, this means a dramatic change in the heat absorption from the sun during the summertime. And cloud cover mitigates this, but as Bob said, instead of 85% of it being reflected, 85% of the solar energy is absorbed in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and this puts pressure on Greenland from the north. This also puts pressure on that permafrost that Bob talked about. Uh, and I'm going to show you a different view of the permafrost. We'll skip over that polar bear. You know that story. This is, a, this is just for purposes of comparison, a rough approximation of the total amount uh, of global warming pollution in the atmosphere today, but the melting and thawing, rather, of that permafrost has the potential to double 
the amount of global warming pollution in the atmosphere of the planet. Uh, Bob showed a slide of, of Professor Katie Wheeler from the University of Fairbanks. This is another one of her slides. This is a shallow lake in Alaska, and that is methane bubbling up. And the other slide that he showed you, I will skip over. I'll show you the first part. Anyway, now, in, in Antarctica, one of the biggest surprises that the ice scientists uh, conveyed to us during the preparation of this report was that the continuing research shows that Antarctica as a whole has now almost certainly tipped into a negative ice balance. As Bob mentioned, the uh, West Antarctic and the Antarctic Peninsula are the ones that have attracted the attention. We've seen in, in the last 20 years all these huge ice sheets break up down either side of the Antarctic Peninsula. And now we are seeing very large areas warming and melting for part of the actual summer uh, in West Antarctica. Those areas there taken together are the size of California. Uh, West Antarctica and Greenland are approximately the same size, and I will skip through uh, the Greenland slides because they have been covered uh, amply. Uh, this is, this is, uh, I think this is Kanger Lucid. Uh, this is uh, one of the two mechanisms by which Greenland and Antarctica raise sea level. This is the meltwater going out into the ocean. Actually, a larger mechanism has to do with those surging, those calving glaciers where the ice begins to move extremely quickly, and I'm going to skip that. You've seen that twice. Uh, Shismarab, and in other coastal areas, you're seeing coastal erosion. You all saw the cabinet meeting for the Maldives underwater. God bless them. They did a pretty good job in getting that message out. Some felt humor. It was intended as pathos, it was intended as a, a cry for help uh, because they're, they're in trouble. And this is another presentation of the climate refugees associated with sea level rise. Roughly speaking, each one meter of sea level rise generates 100 million climate refugees. And again, this does not speak to the refugees from desertification or from crop failure, or from the other consequences uh, of global warming. Uh, final issue uh, relates to drinking water. Uh, for the Americans uh, here, and for any of you that go on the World Wide Web and read the New York Times from time to time, this morning in the New York Times, there's a very long report about this uh, area here. I show this glacier in Peru because it's the source of, the, the, of water for this city across the border in Bolivia. Uh, and, and the city of El Alto and La Paz are right next to each other and they rely on these glaciers for their drinking water. And in some areas the flows have been temporarily increasing, but when it's gone, it's gone. And in many areas, as this article this morning points out, uh, people are already having to, to, to move because they don't have any more water. And there are hundreds of millions of people, more than a billion people on the planet, that get more than half of their drinking water, many of them all their drinking water, from the seasonal melting. Uh, and that has been a, a, a problem there. But you can say, and I do believe, that the deeper bigger problem is that when that ice and snow is gone, they don't have water for drinking and for agriculture. In any case, I, I want to again express my deep gratitude to the foreign minister for the honor of joining him in hosting the meeting in Tromsø and uh, chairing the process uh, by which this report uh, was produced, and again express my gratitude to these outstanding scientists for the work that they did.
astounding of the story we've been telling all of you this afternoon. If I may, Ambassador Brundle, would you join us here at the, the podium, please? 